Hello users, my name is Neftali Flores Rodriguez. I am part of the light and optical team at Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis. I am based at the Charles Perkins Center. The aim of my talk is to provide you with a series of tips and tricks to optimize sample prep protocols. I hope you find the information useful. Let's start by recalling what fluorescence is. Fluorescence is the ability of a emitter, for example, a dye, to absorb light and to emit light at a different wavelength. In most cases, the emitted light has a longer wavelength and therefore lower energy than the absorbed light. As an example of this phenomenon, we can see that when the material called fluorescent of FITSI is excited with a blue light, the resulted emitting light is green. But why do we use fluorescence microscopy? Because it offers high contrast, that is of paramount importance. It offers high specificity. It is quantitative, but only if we are using a well calibrated system and we uh, have um, the control uh, experiments and also because it's compatible with live cell imaging. The image here is an example of um, fixed and stained epithelial cell with three different markers. The magenta is showing clattering coated pits, the green is showing the mitotic spindle, and the blue, the DNA. Now, what is the difference between fixed cell imaging and live cell imaging? If we as a researchers want to investigate what happened, then we need to use fixed cell imaging. But if we want to know how it happened, we must use live cell imaging. I now will start uh, discussing uh, some very important um, tips and tricks in order to get optimal results during fixed cell imaging. First here, a um, brief summary of what a uh, fixed cell imaging is. Fixed cell uh, imaging uses a fixative that renders the specimen dead, but it maintains cellular structure, allowing the use of different tags to investigate specimen morphology and structure. In this panel here, at the top, I'm showing you an example of an epithelial cell stained for actin using a prop called phalloidin. And I use this example because actin uh, staining is a good benchmark of any staining protocol because it's very sensitive uh, to artifacts and errors during sample uh, preparation. Here on the top, you can uh, show the, uh, you can see the different uh, structures as uh, filaments uh, or ruffles, filipodia, that in a badly pre uh, prepared sample are uh, hardly or not seen at all. And here on the top, I put uh, an example uh, of a GSD imaging, a super uh, technique of the same uh, section of the cell in uh, showing you the increase in resolution and also why it's very important to optimize our sample prep protocols. Because in super uh, technique, we can see more of the good, but also more of the bad. I have um, created this list, um, divided it eight di um, different groups that I hope it will um, illustrate uh, the importance of optimizing a fixation protocol. Obviously, the first uh, point to discuss is the fixative. 
The aim of the fixation is, as I said, to maintain cellular structure. We need to avoid the destruction or the disturbance as much as possible of the uh, native state of our specimen during the fix, uh, fixation steps and su subsequent um, steps. The methods are mainly divided into uh, categories, either by using uh, aldehyde fixatives or alcohol sodium fixatives. Why is the difference between aldehyde-based um, fixatives and organic solvents. Organic solvents, such as alcohols and acetone, remove lipids and dehydrate the cells while precipitating proteins on the cellular architecture. This allows the antibodies to penetrate um, the cells, the specimens, because as you uh, may know, antibodies can, they are not cell permeable. On the other hand, aldehydes, they cross link, they are cross-linking, they form intermolecular bridge, and normally true free amino, amino groups, creating a network of link antigens. And these antigens are the ones that are antibodies, C and uh, stain or label for consequent imaging. Aldehydes preserve cell structure much better than organic solvents. However, they might reduce the antigenicity of some cell components. That is why it's very important to test the, uh, which fixative method works better for the uh, protein of interest. Also, aldehydes require a permeabilization step uh, to allow the antibodies uh, access to the specimen. Fixation with both methods may denature protein antigens. And for this reason, antibodies prepared against the nature proteins may be more useful for cell staining. Here, it's recommended that when you order or buy a new antibody, try to uh, get one that has been uh, the nature. Also, you need to consider that a fixative can destroy or mask different epitopes or epitopes in a different way. That's why different methods have to be tested for optimal results. Now, here more information about aldehydes. As previously said, aldehydes cross-link proteins and are very uh, good to preserve cell morphology. They are generally slower acting than solvent fixatives. The preferred fixative, or the one that I will recommend to you, it is paraformaldehyde, PFA. Also, glutaraldehyde gives very good results. It's very good uh, to cross-link proteins. However, results in significant autofluorescence. And so it should be used in low concentration and sometimes with, uh, in conjunction with formaldehyde. And in order to uh, reduce that autofluorescence, we need to add to a, proto uh, to a protocol a quenching step. I will discuss uh, this step uh, later during the talk. PFA. PFA is the smallest polarization product or formaldehyde. It is depolymerized to formaldehyde by water in the presence of a base and heat. The resulting formaldehyde solution is the fixative. Most com commercial formaldehyde contains up to 10% volume to volume methanol, which is added to stabilize the aqueous formaldehyde. However, the presence of the methanol may result in the interference uh, of the staining, especially of membrane-bound proteins, because methanol organic solvents permeabilizes cell membranes, which means it makes holes to the membrane. But why is that um, the methanol is added? 
It is because stabilization is important to prevent um, oxidation of the formaldehyde to formic acids and its eventual repolymerization to paraformaldehyde. Therefore, it's important that always prepare fresh formaldehyde uh, immediately before sample fixation. Um, one can buy the um, uh, PFA in powder, prepare a, a big uh, batch, and then aliquot it and keep it at uh, minus 20 uh, degrees. Throw it on the day uh, that we need to uh, use it, and any leftovers dispose it accordingly. Remember that PFA has um, is quite, uh, toxic to the environment and should be uh, disposed accordingly. Now, I want to discuss with you the difference between formalin and formaldehyde. And this is very important because it's very uh, common to find in our lab formalin. However, formalin and formaldehyde are not the same, although we tend to use the, the, uh, the term interchangeably. However, the chemical composition of each fixative is different. Formalin is made with formaldehyde, but, but the percentage denotes a different formaldehyde concentration than true formaldehyde solutions. For example, a 10% formalin is really a 4% volume to volume formaldehyde solution. So it's very important that you take this into consideration when preparing the dilution of your fixatives. And the, bas the basis for this um, difference is that historically, formalin was prepared with commercial grade stock formaldehyde, which was 37 to 40% weight uh, volume formaldehyde. Also, something important to um, consider is that 100% formalin contains up to 15% of methanol uh, as a stabilizer. And as previously uh, mentioned, any fixative that contains uh, an organic solvent is not uh, recommended if the protein or the structure of the interest is membrane bound or localized at the plasma membrane because it will permeabilize it. PFA. What I recommend is to use fresh 3 to 4% uh, PFA prepare in warm growing media, the same media that you use to culture your cells. As previously mentioned, aldehyde-based fixations take time. What I have found is that a course of 10 to 15 minutes at 37 helps to prevent artifacts and to maintain cellular structure. After this uh, step is completed, it's very important that uh, to wash the specimens with PBS at least three times to remove excess formaldehyde to stop the fixing reaction. Now, how to decrease aldehyde-induced background fluorescence? For PFA fixation, what I recommend is to, uh, post fixation, incubate the samples for around 10 minutes at room temperature with 0.1 molar glycine in 200 millimolar trees. This um, glycine, as a primary amine, reacts with any free aldehydes by neutralizing them, and the result is that the out of uh, fluorescence is highly reduced. After this step is completed, uh, samples have to be washed one to three times with PBS to remove any excess. If you need to use glutaral height, the recommended uh, quenching solution is sodium borohydride. The recommended concentration is 0.1% weight to volume and incubate your samples for seven to 10 minutes maximum. Here is very important that the sodium borohyde has to be fresh to be effective. 
When you prepare the solid bar of height, the solution produces bolts for about 10 to maximum 15 minutes. And it has to be used uh, during this time uh, to um, have uh, good results. After this time, after it stops bubbling, it is not longer effective. Also, glutaral height is um, reported or has been reported to enhance the results when using photoactivated proteins for uh, palm experiments. On this slide, I'm showing you some data presented in a paper by um, Do uh, Donna Willand, in which she discusses the artifacts uh, produced when not following or using an optimized uh, fixation protocol. The top panel shows epifluorescence images uh, of microtubules, and the top, uh, the bottom panel shows the insets uh, on um, super resolution uh, microscopy. As you can see on the left panels, the microtubules uh, haven't been uh, uh, fixed properly, and as a result, they uh, look broken. Uh, there's a lot of uh, material um, um, poorly stained uh, on the sample. On the middle panel, you can see uh, the results when using a lower concentration than the optimal. Although the structures, in this case the microtubules, look less broken, there are still some missing um, parts of um, the microtubules. However, you see that uh, the image is cleaner. If, on the other hand, on, uh, you use a longer period than optimal, the result uh, is quite poor because the fixative can damage the cellular structure, where it can be uh, clearly seen on this uh, panel of the super resolution image that the microtubules uh, look uh, like specks. And here is an example of an, um, um, a microtubules uh, staining an image using an optimal protocol. Now, some information about organic solvents. Organic solvents, such as methanol, precipitate proteins very quickly, but at the same time maintain cellular structure. Usually we use organic solvents when um, we want to stain microtubules or some other components of the cytoskeleton. However, it is well reported that some small molecules Con uh, attached or related to microtubules may be lost during subsequent protein states because they are not well precipitated. Then take this into consideration when designing your experiments. Also, never use uh, organic solvents to fix cells that uh, contain genetically encoded fluorescent proteins such as GFP uh, because the organic solvents quench, uh, quenches the fluorescent protein. Here's some uh, advice uh, when using organic solvents as a fixative. Use them ice cold, minus 20 degrees Celsius at all time. This means that you should keep your solvents uh, in the freezer and when uh, added to your sample, very quickly put the, the sample specimen uh, well submerged on, um, on the solvent back on the freezer. For methanol, I recommend a maximum of three minutes and when using ethanol or acetone, a maximum of 15 minutes. I have found that a combination of methanol and acetone one-to-one -one, can sometimes improve results. That is sample dependent. Also, very important, um, wash your sample uh, with PBS at least three times to remove any excess of the solvent. Also, 
I strongly recommend to rehydrate your specimen in PBS for at least 20 minutes at room temperature. This will enhance the staining protocol. On this slide, I'm showing you some more results from the Willem paper to highlight differences be between organic and aldehyde fixation, and also some resulting artifacts when not following the correct fi uh, fixation protocol. These images were acquired using a super resolution microscopy. And once again, they are showing microtubules. On the top left panel, um, ice cold methanol fixation was used and it was carried out at minus 20 degrees. Most of the microtubules structures are well conserved and, and the staining is okay. However, it's not optimal. Still, it's much better than when all uh, the fixation was carried out uh, at room temperature, as you can see on this panel, with a large proportion of the macules were lost or are incomplete and poorly stained. On the top left panel here in C is a good comparison with the results obtained with PFA uh, fixation done at room temperature. It's quite similar to obtain a, 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 a using ice cold methanol, but it's still not optimal. On the bottom right panel here in D, we can see what Donna uh, found that for um, her specimen, glutaral the height produced the best result by preserving the microtubules the best. You can uh, see complete microtubules. Um, the staining is uh, very clean and, and nice. And as such, for this um, structure or cellular structure, what is recommended is to use glutaral the height. Now, I will uh, progress to um, the second um, step on my list. The importance of using the right detergent to stain your tar. As previously mentioned, antibodies cannot cross the plasma membrane of aldehyde fixed unpermeabilized cells. So we need to use um, a detergent to permeabilize, to permeabilize the membrane and then the antibodies can access intracellular targets. Some common uh, reagents are digitonin, leucoperm, and saponin. If the aim is to stain cytosolic targets, these uh, three detergents are a, a good option to start with. What I will recommend is to use a concentration of 0.5 to 1 milligram, milligram per milliliter and incubations of 10 to 30 minutes at room temperature. If the aim is to stain interior membrane, for example, nucleus or the mitochondria, then we need to use much stronger non-ionic detergents, such as Triton X100. What I would recommend is to treat your uh, samples with concentrations of between 0.1 to 0.5 Triton X100 in PBS with an incubation of at least five minutes to a maximum of 10 minutes at room temperature. If the previously discussed um, reagents are not working for you, something I can suggest is to try SDS. I have found that it's a useful um, permeabilization agent to reveal epitopes that may be masked from antibody. I found it very useful to um, uh, stain proteins of interest in early endosomes and um, multivesicular bodies. And the reason is because it can extract small, poorly cross-linked proteins. 
something important here, it doesn't work on cells that have been fixed using a solvent, an organic solvent. My recommendation uh, is to use it uh, at concentrations between 0.1% and 0.5% in PBS um, and in, in incubate your samples for 5 to 10 minutes maximum at room temperature. And also it's very important to um, not rinse your specimen um, post this step. Also, I found that adding 0.1% of SDS to the blocking buffer during antibody incubation and to the PBS during uh, washing help to maintain the right permeabilization the, um, degree in the sample. Now, the next um, step that I would like to discuss uh, with you is the use of blocking, of a blocking. Here is my advice for the blocking step. The most important um, aspect uh, for this um, step of the protocol is to use a blocking agent that do, does not originate from the species in which the primary antibody was raised. Otherwise, the secondary antibody specificity to the primary antibody will be lost. In other words, if your secondary antibody was produced in GOAT against a mouse primary antibody, a normal GOAT serum will be suitable. And in my hands, the best results that I have been able to generate is when using normal serums. However, I have also found BSA or milk powder to work. Usually I use BSA at concentrations between 1% to 5% in PBS, that is depending on the sample and the thick, uh, uh, thickness of the sample. And then I incubate it for 30 to 60 minutes at room temperature for either agent. Also, it's very important that during the um, blocking incubation step to put your sample in a, a slow rocker to ensure the cover, the full cover of your sample. Now, we will move to um, the following step, which is the primary and secondary um, optimization. I usually in, um, incubate my primary antibodies for one or two uh, to a maximum of two hours at room temperature or overnight at four degrees. That is totally sample dependent. I have found that some antibodies only work when uh, incubated overnight. It's very important that once again, if you um, need to do your um, antibody, your primary antibody incubation at night to put your sample uh, in a container that can be placed in a, a slow rocker to ensure a correct um, a submersion of your sample. One crucial step in um, uh, immunofluorescence is to avoid the sample to dry. Both antibodies, primary and secondary, should be diluted in blocking buffer. Also, it's very important that after the blocking step, you don't rinse your samples. Otherwise, the blocking uh, action may be lost. If you use direct IF, uh, immunofluorescence, after the antibody um, incubation, you can uh, continue to sample uh, mounting. And this is because the primary antibody already is bound to the fluorochrome. However, in an indirect immunofluorescence, which is the most common um, type of I, um, immunofluorescence that we use, additional steps are needed for the labeled secondary antibodies to bind to the primary antibodies. 
Whenever uh, available, use monoclonal primary antibodies. They tend to be more specific than polyclonal antibodies. If you are doing multiple staining, each primary antibody should be generated in different species. Then it is possible to use secondary antibodies conjugated to dyes that are detected by separate channels. If your primary antibodies uh, have been raised uh, on the same species, one reliable option that I have uh, found is antibody conjugation kits, such as Apex and Xenon, both for, uh, from thermal feature. The difference is the amount of the primary anti antibody that um, these kits uh, use. Both of them ha uh, are, uh, work really well. A crucial step here is extensive washing after the antibody incubation to reduce unspecific binding, especially due to the secondary antibody. And what I would recommend for conventional microscopy, uh, meaning epifluorescence or confocal, is to at least wash, wash your specimen three times, five minutes per wash. For more advanced techniques, such as rep, uh, super resolution, um, the washing steps should be increased to at least five steps and uh, optimize accordingly to your sample. Um, my recommendation for your secondary antibodies is to use affinity purified and cross absorb um, and secondary antibodies. This results in an increased specificity of the antibody, uh, which uh, produces less background staining. When designing your experiments, I suggest to select bright, pH insensitive and photostable secondary antibodies. There is um, plenty of information on the vendor's website um, that will help you to uh, uh, with this selection. Also, I want to uh, share with you these uh, tips to reduce artifacts during staining. I recommend to, after taking your um, antibodies and especially your uh, secondary uh, props um, from the freezer or, or, or the fridge, to vortex uh, um, for a few seconds and give them a quick spin to, um, for at least one minute. And then only uh, take uh, the, um, as, um, the amount that you need to get your dilution from the supernatant. I have found that this step will uh, help to eliminate aggregates that might have formed during storage and uh, thereby uh, reduce non-specific background staining. Staining protocols vary uh, with application. Um, what it means, um, which, um, what is your uh, protein or target of um, interest, in the type of microscopy that you want to use. Uh, some of the uh, most common uh, fluorophore dyes used um, uh, by our users here at the facility are uh, called Alexa Fluor from uh, Thermo Fisher, and the recommended starting dilution is uh, 1 to 500. And as previously mentioned, I recommend to uh, dilute your um, dyes in blocking uh, solution. Here I'm showing you what is um, the arrangement that I follow uh, during my primary and secondary incubation. And the main reason is to avoid my specimens to dry. And on the image to the left, um, I'm uh, showing you what I call um, a wet chamber. I constructed just by using a uh, parafilm and I just uh, put some wet uh, tissue on, on the perimeter. And uh, for 18 uh, millimeters uh, cover glasses, I use between 50 to 100 um, microliters 
solution. This also helps to reduce um, consumables uh, use. And in here on this image, I have um, put the um, um, cover glasses, obviously upside down. Uh, the cells have been uh, seeded to the uh, cover glasses. And then I cover uh, from light. That is very important uh, when doing um, the incubation for the secondary antibody. Um, now, uh, I would like to discuss with you the requirement to optimize the antibody dilution to ensure good staining results. It's important that you choose the right number of cells that will give you the desired confluence at the time of staining. You need to consider that if the cell density is too high, if you have very uh, confluent cells, the cell architecture might be deformed and also will uh, result in higher background and low magnifications. On the other hand, if the cell density is too low, you will find it more challenging to find a nice field of view with the optimal cell structure or pattern that you want to visualize. If you are working with non-adhering or uh, specimens that attach uh, weakly to the uh, used container, you may need to coat a such container with polylysin or uh, extracellular uh, matches such as collagen or laminin. Here, my recommendation is to select your, um, whenever possible, your dyes, your secondary antibodies, your probes wisely, because some of these uh, materials uh, may autofluoresce uh, in different um, uh, wavelengths. Also, some tissues such as uh, blood vessels uh, or brain samples may require a gelatin coated or polylysin coated slices to remain attached uh, to the slide after multiple um, wash steps. If you are uh, using uh, working with purified antibodies, I recommend to start with a concentration of one microgram per milliliter. If you have an antiserum, I uh, recommend to start with a concentration of uh, one of a hundred to a maximum of a one and a thousand and check uh, the results. However, it's highly recommended to perform a titration experiment of your antibodies to find the optimal antibody dilution. This is a crucial step. Controls. As with all experimental approaches, care must be taken to ensure that a reliable and reproducible data collection is achieved. One must ensure that every step of our imaging experiment from design to execution is critically assessed for bias, rigor, and reproducibility. Therefore, when designing your imaging uh, experiments, you must introduce and perform the right control experiments to assess for artifacts. It could be, as previously discussed, um, due to the fixative being used or poorly performed. Um, you need to ensure the specificity of your antibodies um, that your secondary antibody uh, is um, not labeling uh, the, the ground st uh, structure, for example. Um, so it's very important to always design and execute the right control experiments and to check that the observed phenotype is true or, or as a consequence of uh, any intervention that uh, has been introduced to the specimen. Number seven. Also, it's important to use um, contrary states. This may help you to identify cellular landmarks. 
for example, if you are interested in a observe some structures in the perinucle perinuclear area of the cell, you may uh, need to use a, a good marker for the nucleus. Or if the target of interest is um, near the plasma membrane, you may uh, need to use what is called a cell mask. Once again, it's important that when you design your experiments, you uh, know that these um, counter stains don't interfere with the staining of your other uh, markers. Finally, sample mounting. It's very important to use a mounting agent with an anti fade added or with anti fade pro properties to reduce photo bleaching. Photo bleaching, also te termed fading, is a photochemical alteration of a dye or a fluorophore uh, such that it permanently is unable to fluoresce. Two products that I recommend uh, that I found reliable are prolonged diamond and prolonged glass. They are hardening mounting agents. However, it has been shown that after curing, they alter 3D structure. This is uh, very important uh, if you want to investigate or to characterize proteins and thick samples. Two other alternatives are VectaShield Plus and a barrier TDE mounting agents. They are non-hardening um, mounting agents. Measure that if you use VectaShield, that is the new generation called Plus. Always mount your uh, um, samples with a drop of mounting medium. Don't use it in excess. Prolonged um, materials usually cure after 24 hours. Always protect samples from light. I recommend not to use mounting media that contains um, DNA markers such as DAPI because they tend to create an excessive uh, fluorescent background. Also, um, if you want to prevent your sample to dry or movement of the cover glass under a microscope, you may uh, want to seal the cover slip perimeter with a clear nail polish. This is very important. Don't use a nail polish with a color. Also, store your samples in the dark uh, in the fridge. This helps to preserve the fluorescence uh, of your um, specimen. Something else that I want to stress is if you want to uh, image thick specimens, you may uh, want to try the new Aveyor TD uh, mounting. This material uh, comes uh, with different refractive index, so you can match it to the immersion uh, agent that you are using, either oil, silicon, or glycerol. So optical aberrations and scattering are minimized. This um, results and light penetrating deeper into the specimen. And as a consequence, the imaging contrast is enhanced. This is um, uh, particularly important uh, when uh, imaging, um, as I said, thick samples using um, multiphoton imaging or super resolution imaging. Now, moving to the last section uh, of my uh, talk, I want to present to you some tips uh, when performing live cell imaging. Once again, here's a reminder why we use live cell imaging is because we want to know how things happen. 
Live cell imaging uses either genetically encoded fluorescent proteins, proteins such as GFP and CHERRY or cell membrane permeable non-toxic fluorescent stains. Now, here are uh, some of the applications that are uh, enabled by using live cell imaging. If uh, our reporters are not fixable, we must use live cell. Some examples are calcium um, fluorescent props, also fluid face markers. If we want to investigate or to address very dynamic events uh, that last for milliseconds and seconds, such as vesicle traffic in or calcium flux, we should use live cell imaging. Also, on the other hand, if we want to image or visualize um, cellular behavior that takes days, uh, we need to use long uh, live cell. This uh, allows to image um, cell cycle or time-dependent toxicity. In order to generate meaningful um, data, we must ensure that our live cell is non-invasive. For this, we need to control, properly control the environment in which our cells are being imaged. In order to um, maintain the right conditions of pH and nu nutrients and envir environment humidity. You must ensure that your microscope is well calibrated to um, maintain the correct environment conditions for mammalian cells at temperature of 37 degrees. And if you are using a, a CO2 dependent media, that um, there is a supply of uh, CO2. Also, very important during um, live cell imaging experiments is to avoid um, photo damage. As a such, we must ensure uh, that the illumination settings are uh, used at as low as possible. Um, also, if you require uh, or you are trying to image very dynamic uh, events in your specimen, you must ensure that your equipment is uh, capable to achieve fast imaging, commonly uh, referred as streaming. Here in the facility, we have systems that allow you to image um, up to 90 frames per second. On the other hand, uh, if you, uh, the events that you want to visualize um, are very slow, you um, may use time-lapse imaging. A typical uh, frame rate is of uh, one frame per minute to 10 frames per minute. Also, very important is to achieve low levels of exogenous protein expression. And this is uh, to prevent perturbation of the organelle or the compartment that you want to image. And this is uh, because as previously uh, mentioned, we tend to um, exogenously introduce the reporter, the GSP um, TAC protein. And if express it um, at very high uh, um, levels, we might uh, alter the um, normal homeostasis of the cells. Here, I put some uh, results for a case study in which I was interested to analyze the effects of using high illumination versus low illumination settings when doing streaming and time-lapse imaging. As you can see, when using low illumination settings, neither the apoptotic levels or the cell cycle is uh, significantly, significantly um, impacted. However, 
when using high doses of light, the amount of cell death um, that is uh, observed is greatly increased. Also, you can uh, see uh, the results when com um, compare, uh, comparing the mitotic index that the cell cycle was heavily impacted. Then take this into consideration. Always aim uh, uh, to use for the uh, lower levels of uh, illumination. Here I put an example as a part of that same case study, uh, which highlights the importance of not overexpressing the reporter. For this example, what you are seeing is uh, two cells that have been um, transfected with EGFB 11. There is a marker for um, recycling endosomes. You can see them traveling. Uh, in and out of the Golgi area towards the plasma membrane. And what I added is to develop a method to ensure that this reporter was expressed to a maximum uh, of 20% to the endogenous levels. And here in this table, what I'm showing you is two different parameters, size and speed. Comparing when using low amounts of DNA during transfection versus high amounts of DNA, that what is the um, most of the vendors recommend uh, when using the products. As you can see, uh, when using low amounts of DNA, that was um, not 0.01 micrograms of DNA, the size, the measure size of the um, GFP RAV11 was very similar to the endogenous RAV11, the ones that were stained uh, using um, antibodies. However, when using higher amounts, 50, uh, not point, uh, 5 micrograms of DNA, I, go, I detected an, in, an increment of nearly 50% um, in the size of uh, those organelles. Um, with my analysis, I could uh, see that uh, most of the endosomes, when using a la, uh, high amounts of DNA, look um, distorted, uh, with um, the shape being perturbed. An important parameter that I used for this case study uh, was speed. And my assumption uh, was if now the endosomes um, are, uh, la are uh, larger and large, they must um, um, move uh, at a slower speed. And indeed, the tracking of these endosomes show that. As you can see, the, um, when uh, those endosomes uh, with, um, were um, labeled with, uh, after using low amounts of DNA during transfection, uh, were seen to have a speed, uh, an average speed of 0 0.90 micrometers per second compared to a huge drop when using large amount of DNA, then please take this into consideration when designing your experiments. Then with this slide, I would like to finish uh, showing you this image that I uh, generated using a STED microscopy, uh, which is a super resolution technique. I live um, uh, stained um, for actin, and this is a metaphase cell. Uh, the uh, cell cycle, you can see um, all the different structures, the filipodia, uh, and all the different uh, domains of acting in a um, dividing cell. Um, as a main conclusion, I just uh, hope that the information that uh, I described in this presentation will help you to um, improve, to optimize your sample uh, preparation in order to uh, achieve meaningful data and uh, high cal uh, quality images. Um, uh, please, if you have any questions or doubts, contact me uh, on my email address that is uh, shown here and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you.